This is a really, really interesting day today. <clears throat> and I'm, uh, I'm sure that for all of you, it is something that you have greatly looked forward to um, since we first discussed having a special speaker come in on the Holocaust. And today, we have a very special guest. Um, his name is Mr. Herbert Heller. And he is um, an, an American citizen now who originally was from Hungary, who, Czechoslovakia, Czechoslovakia. Close, enough. close enough, who was a, who was a Jewish prisoner at um, Auschwitz, who managed to escape, make his way into this country, start a whole new life, and we are very privileged today to hear his story which, for the very first time, he is going to share in public. So it's a rare privilege and opportunity, and I would like you to join me in welcoming Mr. Heller with a very warm Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm Herb Heller. I was born in 1929 in the Republic of Czechoslovakia, which is now Czech Republic. And uh, my father was an engineer, my mother was a homemaker, and I had an older brother, seven years older, who was a student at a university. In uh, 1941, Hitler occupied Czechoslovakia, and uh, as being Jewish, they didn't like us, and they took us to a small town in Czechoslovakia, which was called Terezin, that was in kind of a semi-prison, and uh, it was a model one because they were bringing in the International Red Cross to show them how well we were treated. Well, that didn't last very long. In 1942, my whole family, we all were shipped to Auschwitz in a cattle car by rail, and we were packed there like you know, as, as a cattle car would tell you, just like cattle. We arrived and we had to line up and to be tattooed. Um, I don't have my tattoo anymore, but uh, my number was <coughs> A2109. I stood behind my father and he was A2108. At that point, they separated men, women, children, and we had to be looked over by a German doctor, his name was Dr. Mengele, who later on was called Dr. Death. He determined if you're going to live or die already at that moment. If they thought you were weak and unable to work, you were, you were shown to the left. The people on the left side were taken to a place which they were thought were showers and instead of water coming out, cyanide, cyanide poison came out. And then from there on they were taken in a crematorium where they were burned. So as we arrived we would see the flames and the, uh, from the chimney going all the time. I was able to stay with my father. My mother and my brother were put in a different barracks. And uh, our life started in Auschwitz, which was very, very hard. In the mornings, we all had to line up to be counted. Then we would go and try to wash up. They had very primitive type of uh, showers and things of that nature. and. Uh, I was able to get a job as a messenger at a first aid station, which gave me access to some pills if I needed it or things of that nature. And uh, life was very, very tough. There were a lot of prisoners which were taken on a work detail. And I know in one winter time, 
there was one of the prisoners who tried to escape and uh, the uh, Germans always had with them not only their, their arms but also dogs and so on and uh, that particular man didn't make it very far. The dogs caught him and they marched him back and uh, I saw him carrying his shoes. They made him take his shoes off and in a winter in the snow and ice he had to march barefoot back to camp, you know, with, with the uh, SS troopers and whatever they were. And then we had to all get together to watch as they would have a public hanging. They were trying to make it a point to say, you escape and you die. And it was just something to make sure that all of us would be aware of that and discourage us of anything of that nature. After a few months in camp, my mother was shipped out to another camp, which I had no idea where she was sent. My older brother was shipped out. And then two months later, my father was shipped out also to another camp. And I stayed behind. I was 15 years old pretty much on my own, and uh, but uh, I think all of us have a survival instinct, and uh, I was determined to survive. Um, there were so many rumors that uh, the American army will eventually free us. Well, it did happen at a later date where General Patton's army made their way to Poland and uh, they start to march us out of a camp which was Auschwitz and uh, on the way there were so many of us which were pretty weak and couldn't go any further so they were put aside and later on shot and at night we stayed at farmhouses. As we were marching, I would see signs pointing that Prague, in Czech would be Praha, was so many kilometers. And uh, I was very fortunate that I knew a second language, which I think is so important for everybody to have, which was German. And I had a little cap over my, my head because I was shaved like this. I had my tattoo. And I found a little jacket I put on, and uh, I had some thoughts that maybe I could make my way to Prague, because there was so much confusion. As the uh, American army was coming, the diehard Germans, some of them did not want to be occupied by now the, now the U.S. army. So there was quite a bit of chaos and they were all making their way to the railroad station. So one night in one of the uh, farmhouses, I just stayed in a straw or hay, whatever it was. And in the morning as everybody else marched out, I stayed behind and uh, I joined a group of German refugees which were making their way to the station. The station was surrounded by the what they at that time called the Wehrmacht, which was a German army. But being that there was so much confusion, I kind of blended in and I started running toward there. And in German, I would say, Mutti, Mutti, wo bist du? Meaning, Mother, Mother, where are you? Make believe that I was part of the Germans, which I got separated from the family. And I made my way to the uh, train station, which went to Prague. I think I skipped a lot uh, from before, but uh, it's, uh, <laughs> this is my first time, so you have to kind of excuse me on that. Uh. Anyway, I got off in Prague, and again, there were police, I mean, the German police there and everything. And before the, before, Hitler occupied Prague. We being Jewish, we had we've been introduced to a uh, 
Catholic family by name of Kral, which means uh, king. That was their name. And it, there was a mother, father, and there were three, three sons. And we said to each other, the family, that if we ever get out or survive, that we would try to meet at that place. Well, at that time, it was still occupied by the Germans. I made my way up to that place, and uh, they let me in. And they said they would hit me out. Well, I was so afraid that if the Germans would come in and see me with my tattoo on my hand, that they would shoot the whole family. So in the bathroom, I found some acid, and uh, I put a little bandage on my hand and poured acid on it. And after a few days, it just festered and burned out, so I no longer have my tattoo. This was about uh, March of 1945. On uh, May 5th, the Czechs <coughs> decided to uh, have a revolution, which is like an uprising. They took the cobblestones from the streets and tried to build barricades. They tried to occupy the uh, radio station, but the Germans were still there. And it was pretty difficult for them to fight with stones and barricades of wood against German tanks. Matter of fact, when they occupied the radio station, the Germans had their tanks across the street and they were just, they just destroyed it completely. And then came May 9th and the Russian army started to free Czechoslovakia. See, the agreement was that the American army would free Poland and the Russian army would free Czechoslovakia. So there was a revolution between May 5th and May 9th. May 9th it ended. The Russians came in. They were so welcome because what the, what the German people did, it was really quite an oppression. There was hardly any food. You couldn't do anything if, if you broke any laws. I mean, they, they didn't think twice to shoot you or put you in prison or do anything like that. So anyway, I was already in Prague, not knowing where my father or mother or brother are. And every day I would go to a place where the refugee um, offices were set up and uh, the Red Cross was uh, cooperating and I would say Herbert Heller is looking for his mother A4456, that was her number, and father A2109, and I forgot my, my brother's number. And uh, this went on for a few months and then uh, I would come home to what was then my home, and I was told that they have a surprise for me, and the surprise was uh, that my mother has returned. So I got reunited with my mother after not seeing her for over a year and a half. She was alive, she was shipped at that time, I found out later, to Hamburg, where she was cleaning up bricks after the uh, air raids, and also being in a German camp, but that was her work detail. So uh, that was really a happy occasion. I never did find out where my father perished or my brother. I'm still looking through it. Uh, the Red Cross is getting a little more access to the Germans always kept very good records, so there's somewhere there's a record that my father, Carl Heller, A2108, you know, wherever he was sent, or my brother, but I have not found that out. Then, 1945, my mother started to write to a great aunt who she knew moved from uh, Czechoslovakia. She married a man from Austria, 
and they moved to uh, California, to San Francisco. So she wrote a letter to Augusta Jelinek, that was her name, San Francisco, USA. She didn't know the address. And because it was right after the war, the postmaster made it his point to hand deliver the letter to my great aunt. And from there on, they kept in touch. And uh, in 1946, my great aunt sent us tickets to emigrate to USA. She guaranteed for us that if we arrive, when we arrive, that we will never become a burden on the United States. We could never collect unemployment or anything like that that she guaranteed us. And we were able to get a visa and we came to this country. Uh, we, at that time, some of the railroads were bombed out in Europe. So we went by bus, which is now similar to like you would go on a Greyhound. It was called Chedok. And we left Prague, we went through Germany, Denmark, and Sweden, and then from Sweden to New York by ship. The ship was the SS Gripsholm, which during the war was a uh, troop ship and a Red Cross ship, so we were on it. We arrived at Ellis Island around Thanksgiving 1946. And then another rumor mill started right away that if any of us would be found that we have a disease or sickness, all of us will be sent back. So they had American doctors interviewing and checking youth to make sure that you don't have TB or any, any other diseases. And uh, we passed, we were in good shape, and we went from Ellis Island from New York by train through Chicago to Oakland, and then we stayed with my aunt. The experiences in Europe right after you know we were freed were just something which is hard to forget, but it's very tough to put them in a chronological order because uh, first I tried to forget everything and it doesn't usually work. You, you see movies and you see German soldiers or you see people in their striped suits being freed from camps and so on that stays with you for a long, long time. In the beginning, you have such hatred for the Germans that uh, it almost takes over your, you know, your whole meaning of existence. But uh, little by little, I started to, you know, just try a different life, and uh, this country has been just fabulous to me. We arrived around Thanksgiving, and my great aunt had a friend who was from the same country as I was, who had a business, and he took me and introduced me to a manager of a uh, variety store. Now, mind you, at that time, I spoke Czech and I spoke German, and I spoke no English. And uh, he says, I can start working day after, day after Thanksgiving as a stock boy at 80 cents an hour. It was in 1946, that was my first job. I worked uh, 40 hours there, it was $32, and taxes were very little, so I got $27 clear. And I went to night school because in Europe I was only able to finish grade school. I never went beyond that because when Hitler came, Jews were not allowed to go to school anymore. So all, all the only education I had, had was great. I was just grade school. So working at Woolworth, which was a dime store, they don't, they don't exist anymore. I worked Monday through Friday. And then at night, I would go to night school, and uh, there was called Commerce Night School, which is in San Francisco on Van Ness. And the subjects I took was English, history, citizenship, and remedial math. And uh, Saturdays and Sundays, 
I got a job cleaning yards. And that was a good job because I was making a dollar an hour. So that was, it was quite a bit more already. Then that same person suggested that maybe, even though I wanted to become an engineer, but not having completed school, I couldn't, I couldn't get into that. I spoke very poor English, but I was learning and tried very, very hard. He suggested maybe I can get a job at Macy's to, to get into merchandising. I didn't know what that was, but uh, being young and I took his advice and so I applied and I said I would like very much to get on their training program. Well, I was told that to get on a training program you have to be a college graduate, which I was not, and also to have a master's in business administration. But they said, if I really would like to get a, you know, start the retailing, maybe I want to start as a stock boy. So there I started at a dollar an hour as a stock boy. Three months later, they made me a head of stock, which means I was responsible to make sure that every, all the merchandise was stocked properly and straightened out and so on. And I got a raise to a dollar twenty-five an hour. Well, that was big money. You could go to the movies for twenty-five cents. At night school, they had some beautiful young ladies, which some were from Brazil and some from Germany and so on. And I had the courage to ask them to go out to the movies, and I could afford it. It was only 25 cents. So I remember once I asked one of the young ladies from Brazil if she would go with me to the movies, and she says, only if her sister goes. So I wound up with two. <laughs> Not for the price of one, pays for both. But anyway, after a few months working at Macy's as a uh, head of stock, they, uh, in, it was in a toy department, the Christmas season came, and I was able to work 60, 70, 80 hours a week, and at a dollar and a quarter an hour plus overtime, I was making really, really good money. Well, that didn't last long. They, made, they promoted me to an assistant buyer. I still worked the same hours, but I was making then $225 a month. Before, I was making a lot more because of overtime. But that was really a promotion. I mean, being young and from another country and assistant buyer, they give you a white carnation and you have an authority to sign checks for people and so on. So I worked, worked and worked. And then the buyer of the toy department got promoted and went to another store and they asked me if I would consider becoming a buyer. And I said, my God, certainly. So at age 21, I was made a, uh, a buyer at Macy's. And uh, I was sent to New York on a buying trip. And one of my first showrooms I went to, I would just tell them, I said, you know, I'm really very young. I depend on your help. I'd like to get your advice, and I said, you can only not treat me right once because you won't have a chance to do it the second time. And I was very, very good at it, and uh, to make a long story short, I stayed at Macy's for nine years, started there as a stock boy at a dollar an hour. I became a buyer first in toys. Later on, I became an associate buyer in bedding, and then a buyer. And then, at a later time, I got called that the uh, buyer of the yardage, at that time yardage was very popular, cotton, silks, woolens, rayons, patterns, and so on, was very ill, and if I would take his job. And uh, being a jokester, I later on, mentioned to them, I said, you know, they'd never ask me if I'm not colorblind, because they'd be a little bit tough to pick out yardage. But anyway, I was not colorblind, and I stayed on. And uh, 
I stayed there from 1949 through 1958. Then that same fellow said to me, well, maybe you want to start your own business. And I said, well, how do you do that? He says, oh, you just open up a store and uh, try to sell merchandise. So by that time, I was really rich. I already saved up $5,000. I was married in 1956. I met, met a young lady in New York. And uh, evidently, the winters in New York are not pleasant because she liked California. Maybe she even liked me because we got married. And uh, we opened up a store in Marin County in San Rafael in 1958. And I've been there for 50 years, and I just turned that over to my <coughs> daughter and my grandson. So now I'm retired and been so bored that uh, now they suggest that I speak in front of you. I know it's not a well-paying job, but I thought that's going to do something for me. So that's about it. But uh, you're welcome to ask anything, because I left out a lot. and. Uh, so anything you want to ask, please do. What's the name of your wife? My wife's name is Annette, and I met her in New York when I was buying for the uh, betting department. It was a firm which was selling Fieldcrest, Fieldcrest Mills, and he mentioned that there's a good-looking young lady in the next building, a blonde. At that time, she was a blonde. It took me a while to figure out she was not a blonde, but. Uh, she was a blonde, and uh, we got married in 56. Now, I want to just tell you how rich I am. When I arrived <laughs> from, from the other country, they stamped in my passport that we could take with us 10 US dollars. Now I have not only a wife, three daughters, and 10 grandchildren. So you can see what $10 did. That's my achievement. What was it like before the war, before the Nazis? You know, before the war, I had, uh, my life was fantastic. My father being an engineer, he was making good money. We always had a car, we had a car. I remember he had a Tatra, he had a Zetka, he had a Skoda. Those were some of the cars in Europe at that time. We lived in a nice place. My father traveled a lot, so I didn't get to see him much, but I do remember that uh, I brought home some homework from math and uh, asked him if he could uh, help me. Well, his help was he gave me the answer because he would <laughs> use a slide rule. I put the answer down and I flunked because uh, they didn't see how it was done and they knew that I didn't do that. Another time, too, going to grade school, I would come home and I would tell my father that, uh, God, these young kids, they're behind school buildings and they're smoking. And I said, I don't understand that. So he said, what do you mean you don't? And he takes out a cigarette case, lights a cigarette, <coughs> gives it to me. I totally got sick. I threw up like, like anything. And that kind of cured me from smoking. I don't <coughs> smoke. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I think you can still have some fun. <laughs> One other story I want to tell you what happened on my ship, uh, the SS Gripsholm, coming from Sweden to New York. It was a nine-day nine -day trip, and uh, the, the seas were pretty rough, and uh, I was getting really, really seasick. And there were some beautiful young ladies from Sweden coming to New York on a visit. And I got to meet some of them, and they were quite friendly, and they invited me to their cabin. And the minute I got to their cabin, I got so sick, I had to run upstairs and to start feeding the fish because I was sick. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of people talk about their fish stories, how big the fish was. Well, this one got away. This one I never got. So this is my big fish story from Sweden. Can you tell me about the coming across uh, food on board the ship? The, the food was totally unknown to me. I mean, certain things. I mean, in Europe, it's potatoes and uh, uh, pig, 
uh, pig uh, from a pig food is is very popular there. And on a ship, because it was getting close to Thanksgiving, they had a turkey, which we usually don't. They have goose in Europe. They usually cook for the holidays. And cornflakes was something which I've never had before because in Europe you usually have hot cereal. You don't have, they, we didn't have cornflakes. And uh, so that was a little bit new to me. Also, when we arrived at my aunt, who was a ex-school teacher, and she was pretty strict, and uh, she would always complain to my mother, you should see how much sugar Herbert puts on his cornflakes. So that was one of the complaints I had. And luckily, my mother got a job as a housekeeper, and for that we got room and board. I was, I was working at Woolworth and going to night school and have another part-time job, so we didn't live with her anymore because she was really very strict. And I guess after being in camp for so long, I was just not, not really that happy to be there. So. But we certainly were grateful that she brought us over. I think at that time, it cost about 250 US dollars to get us by bus from Europe on a ship and then by train to San Francisco. There was a total cost of the uh, passage, which now I think would be quite a bit more. What was life like in the camp? In a camp, in Terezine, being that that was an easy camp, I left in the mornings and I was becoming, I was going to learn to become a gardener, so I worked on a little work detail, planting you know, fruits and uh, vegetables and things of that nature. And uh, at night we were together in a family under big tents and so on, but they had showers and it was clean and we really weren't threatened that much. It started being pretty tough the minute we arrived in Auschwitz. I mean, that was a extermination camp, totally. We were in a camp which had barbed wire on both sides. <coughs> they had German soldiers patrolling with dogs, so you couldn't even talk to anybody to the left of you or the right of you in another, in another camp. And you really didn't know from one day to the next if you're going to be alive or not, or if you're going to ever see your family again or anything like that. But. Uh, with determination, you get a little more strength. But uh, if you become sick or so, there would have been no help for you at all. I mean, you get TB or you get something else, you just die, and that's it. There was no real care for you of any kind. The food consisted of uh, what the Germans call Eintopf, meaning one pot. They would have a huge pot, and it would have uh, some vegetables in it, potatoes, and very seldom small pieces of meat. You have a little, like you wear Boy Scout or Girl Scout, you know, canteen, and you stand in line, and they just put it in, and that's it. Go ahead. Uh, what's TB? Tuberculosis. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. At that time, they, they really didn't have much cure for that. I mean, it's something where it's been fairly well eradicated. I mean, in this country, I think tuberculosis was known where you were a coal miner and you worked in those conditions and so on. So there were a lot of the workers which died from that, but uh, here it's not, not so much prevalent anymore. Yes, sir. Um, did you find yourself after you got out of the camp uh, do you find yourself still hating the Germans? Very much so. And to this that day took also? A long, I tried not to anymore, but uh, it took a long, long time, yeah. I wouldn't buy a German car, I, anything German. And then later on I kept thinking it's the next generation which really had nothing to do with what their fathers or grandfathers did. And uh, I think the Germans, not only disliked or wanted to 
just eradicate the Jews, and they did a good job at that. There were four million Jews which they, which they killed one way or another. And they also didn't like the gypsies. And if any child or anybody was, had a mental problem that was not, they, they wanted to have the perfect race. They didn't want anybody who was defective any which way, mentally or physically. Dr. Mengele also was known for doing experiments on the uh, prisoners, really cruel experiments. I mean, just for his sake, to, it was more like butchering than, you know, doing anything else. Anything else? What was meeting Dr. Mengele like in the camp? Well, here's a little guy about 14, 15 years old, frightened, and you see the boots, those black boots, and a man in a black uniform. That's another thing, too, is uh, I will never wear anything which is black. I, black is still a color which frightens me, and uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't wear that. But to see him, I mean, there is authority in front of you, and uh, you know he's got the power to keep you alive or put you to death. So, I mean, in our language, he was called Dr. Death. That's what he was. What kind of work did you do at Auschwitz? In Auschwitz, I worked as a uh, messenger, and then later on I became an orderly for some of the uh, higher-ups, cleaning up the, uh, their apartment and things of that nature. Just manual labor, nothing. I mean, I had no trade, I had no, you know, I really didn't have much more to offer than just do menial labor. Just a lucky dude, that's all. Yes? Um, you say you own a, or your family owns a store in Marin? We have a children's store in Marin called Heller's, Heller's for Children. It's been there 50 years, yeah which has everything from, from an infant to toddler, including furniture, strollers, high chairs, and so on. It's been very good. When we started in 58, there were a lot of young families in Moraine starting out. We lived in a little area which was called uh, Terra Linda, where they had these Eichler homes. They were kind of really beginner homes. They were nice for the young families. and. Uh, We've done really, really well uh, as we just grew from doing very little every day to quite a bit of business. And uh, now, naturally, there's more competition, but uh, so it's still in our hands. And my daughter and uh, her husband are running it. One thing I like to emphasize, it's really, really important to have a second language, and secondly, to finish high school and go on to college, because uh, I think I was just really, really fortunate that I got some of the early breaks where I was able to start at the bottom and worked up. But it's a lot easier when you have a college degree and uh, get a job, because the, the people which later on worked for me as assistants and so on, they all had degrees and so on, and I just always felt that they were just so much smarter than I ever would be, and it's just something I really missed that I didn't finish. And uh, the second language really saved my life, being a German, because without that, I don't think I could have made my way to Prague. In in Europe, you usually have to have a second language. In Czechoslovakia it was either German or French. So when I came, it was Czech and German that I spoke. I had a fantastic teacher at the night school. She was a lady from, from Ireland. She was tough as it can be. I mean, there was no excuse for anything. You had to do your homework or else you stayed. And I didn't want to stay late because in case the Brazilian ladies want to go to the movies, I wanted to go. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, would you explain again how you escaped from Auschwitz? Okay, uh, from Auschwitz we were marched out. From Auschwitz nobody ever escaped. Okay. That doesn't happen. But uh, as the American army led by General Patton was freeing Poland, they marched us out of the camp. And as I said, at night we would stay in farmhouses. What they were going to do with us after all these marches and farmhouses, I really don't know. I am really thinking because I haven't heard or found out from anybody else if anybody else survived because I really think at one point that when the Germans, when the American army was coming closer that all of us on that march were, were shot because anybody who couldn't keep up marching, they shot him. And I don't know where they would have marched us afterwards. This I never found out. But uh, the only reason I took a chance was that I thought that each time we were lined up to be counted, that they were so confused how many got shot, how many died, and how many are left, that possibly because there was so much of a confusion there that they're not going to they're not going to look for me. And uh, I can say, knowing German, acting like at that time a German who was running away from the American army, I m made my way there. It's just something which was just a fluke and uh, really luck. So then you posed as a German? I posed as a German, yeah, to get on a train. At that time, they didn't even ask for tickets or anything like that because they were just putting so many there. And uh, that, I think, saved me, definitely. Because if they, if they would find me out as a uh, Jewish refugee or Jewish uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, escapee from camp, there's no questions asked. They just shoot. They shoot first, ask later. They don't. Yes, sir. Um, have you been back to Auschwitz? Uh, no, I try not to. I, the only thing I did do is I left what is now Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia, 62 years ago. And uh, it was every year that I was going to go back. And I finally made it last year. We went to visit. And uh, that family who hid me out, they no longer alive because at that time they were already, when I was 16 or 15, 15, 16, they were already in their late, late 60s, so they no longer alive. The only person I still, uh, as a relative, I found alive is a, uh, a, not a, niece, a cousin, like a third cousin, who is uh, older than I am. She's 86 years old and she's still alive, so I visited with her. Yes? Um, did they force you to wear a yellow star? Oh yes, I was gonna, I also have that. That was called the Judastern. Jude means Jew in German, Stern is star. There was yellow and you have to wear that, definitely. There was the, right when uh, Hitler occupied uh, Czechoslovakia, that was in 1941. I have a picture of it there, I'm gonna pass it. I also have my, my still my first passport here, so. Uh, I can, you can see that. Yes. Did you ever see Hitler like in person, like in front? No, of I never did. No, I was very fortunate. I did not want to see him in person. I saw enough of him on the news. Yeah. I think that man had to have been, I, I don't know what, a total maniac or something. It's just unbelievable what he could do. But what bothers me is is not just that one person can be the way he was, but that he was able to get the Germans to do things, and uh, it's unbelievable. Yes? How old was your mom when you met her again, when you heard about her? She was 46, 48 years old. I've had her till she was 78, so I was very fortunate with my mother for a long time after we got reunited. Yes? How old were you when you came to California? I was 17. 
That was in 1946. I'm 79 now, so you don't have to figure it out. Yes? Did you make any friends in Auschwitz? Yes. Yes. Well, my best friend was my father when, you know, I was with him. And uh, then where I was working, they were really, really very kind to me and so on. And uh, But I'll tell you, it's it's mostly everybody for themselves because everybody wants to survive and it's so hard. They really, as much as you want to, it's very difficult to do that. They don't have the time or anything for you. Yeah. I had a lot of friends in this country, especially at night school. <laughs> yes? How old were you when you went to Auschwitz? I was... Uh, Fifteen. Yes? Um, how would you respond to a student who says something like, I don't like history, bores me, doesn't mean anything to me, head down on a desk, doesn't pay attention in class? What, would you, what message would you have for them? I think they miss one of the most important things. I mean, I think the past is so important to be aware of because that's probably going to be our future. If we don't know the past, it's very hard to know where the future is going to be. And I think to me that's important and I think it's very hard to forget what some of the wrong things were and hopefully the history will even show some of the things which this country maybe shouldn't be doing and so on. So I mean, I think it's really, really important. I think school is most important, I mean, to me, it's not because I'm here in a class, but like I say, I wish I had the opportunity to have finished high school and go on in Europe, they call it gymnasium, which is like a college and so on. I so wanted to do what my father did, I, I admired him so much, he was so smart, so knowledgeable, and I just thought this would be the greatest thing to do. Yep. Anybody else? Sure. Um, what was your reaction or how did you feel when you went back to um, your hometown? I did a lot of crying. Especially when I met uh, with my cousin and uh, she still had a little a tiny clock which my father had and she said she's been saving it for me for 60 years. So there was a real tear to her. Um, what was your reaction, like your family's reaction, when you heard like Hitler was like coming into your town and like gathering? Well, you were frightened. You're, you know, you're powerless. You're frightened, and uh, you just know that uh, it's it's gonna be bad. Did you try to like go like anywhere to like, like escape? No. 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 By that time, it would have been too late because once the German occupied, they closed the borders and. Uh, it was very, very difficult to do that. Matter of fact, I mean, there was a Czech un underground, which uh, there was a German officer by the name of Heydrich, and they were able to get to him and assassinate him. And because of that, the Germans just took a small town, I forgot the name of it anymore, and because they, they heard that some of the people which assassinated him were being hidden out in that town. They just went and they shot everybody in that town. Men, women, and children. And they took bulldozers and they just flattened it out. It was just... Uh, so with the Germans you could not... You couldn't win. That was not possible. Yes? Just out of curiosity, do you still have nightmares about this? I do. And, uh, when I come home and uh, my wife is watching TV and it would have anything on with uh, German soldiers or anything like that, I just, I try, instead of asking her, you know, turn it off, I just go in another room. So I, I don't watch it. No, I can't. It's very hard. Actually, uh, about 10 years ago or better, Spielberg started a uh, some project where he wanted the uh, survivors 
go to a certain place and be recorded to put down their, you know, what they went through, something like I'm telling you right now. And I filled out the form, and I kept it for 10 years. Then after 10 years, because I had to get sick and I was in a hospital, I had surgery, and I kept thinking, God, you know, if I don't make it next time, how would my kids know what's going on and so on? So I faxed it in to him, to there, to wherever it was, and uh, I got a phone call that that project's been closed because that was 10 years ago, but there's a place in San Mateo where they will have a camera and some interviewers, and uh, I was able to just relate, you know, some of the experiences and so on. So my daughters have a, uh, a tape, and I had it made into a CD now where it just gives them a little bit of the chronolo chronology of the events and so on. I never wanted to do it because I didn't want them to feel sorry for me. I, it's the last thing I ever wanted. Uh, some of the things you can relate to, they almost don't seem possible, and unfortunately they are. So, so this is my second chance here. Anything else? There's a lot of things I, f I skipped and forgot, but uh, yes. Uh, when you had to leave your house, what was something that was that you had to give up, or you were able to bring? No, uh, when when they when they brought us to uh, Terezine, we just brought with us, you know, some small necessities, just a little bit of clothing, and uh, and that was it. No, nothing at all. You had nothing. I mean. In Auschwitz, you had the pair of shoes, and you had your pair of socks, and underwear, and pants, and a shirt, and something, and they give you an old horse blanket. You slept on uh, bunk beds made, made out of wood with a straw, straw mattress, and things. No, you had nothing. Nothing at all. It was pretty primitive. primitive. It must have been very dangerous um, for the family that put you up. It was, definitely. It was unbelievable that uh, they did that. Yeah. The husband was a veteran, and uh, they, like I say, they had three sons, and to do that, I mean, to take, that's really taking an awful chance. I was very, very lucky that that happened, yes. Yes. When they, um, when that family hid you, did yes. you have to stay inside all the time? Or? I did. We actually had air raids and things of that nature, and uh, this was in an apartment building on the fifth floor, and the family would always go downstairs in a basement the minute the sirens went on, and I would never leave the apartment because I was always afraid that somebody down there wouldn't, would want to know who I was or, or so on, so I never took a chance, no. That was the least of my scarcity being, you know, if I would have been bombed or something. Yes? How would they figure out if you were Jewish or not? Pardon me? How, how would they figure out if you were Jewish or not? Well, they would know, the, the people downstairs, they would know who lives in a building, and I wasn't part of it. And uh, at that time, there were a lot of people which may, you may want to call traitors or whatever it is. They want to squeal on you because they would get a reward. So if they could find something that somebody was listening on a shortwave radio even, they can turn you in and you go to prison. I mean, that's a Czech family. They didn't want you to know anything. So that's just a chance I wouldn't want to take and putting them in danger. Yes? Uh, when you were in camp, what kept you going? Like, why did you have such, like, a will to survive? Like. You know, I think we all have a will to survive. I think uh, we all do. I'm sure you do when you have a hard test. You want to survive, you want to pass. I think the same thing applies to, you know, being alive. I don't know why. But I, what I'm I, saying is like, um, like I imagine that when you were at camp, at times you thought of like, not wanting to live anymore. No, that never, that, that never, that never ever, no. You know, you do things sometimes, you don't know why you do that. Hopefully, when we do things, we, we do, um, do the right things. Some people sometimes don't do the right things, but I mean, I think we all want to survive. I think that's just the nature. Yeah.
like I say, I wanted to survive, but I was also very lucky. I think luck's got a lot to do. Sometimes you have to build your own luck, but uh, you you really have to be a little bit lucky to do, to do what, you know, to come through. Yes? Um, how Todd had asked about um, history and learning about it. The Holocaust Museums? Yes. Would you recommend people going and seeing those and seeing what happened in all the graphics and everything? I, I would. It's, it's kind of hard, you know, to see that. But I think if the person hasn't been through it, it's not as difficult for an outsider to see it, to, to know what happened and make sure that it never happens again. I mean, that's the worst thing, what, you know, is happening. And right now we have things which in Africa are going on, in Tibet the Chinese are shooting at the uh, monks, and I mean, there are things which are happening now which I wish didn't happen, and uh, there are still people who say that Holocaust never happened, that it's just, you know, made up and so on. So I think it's important for everybody to see that, you know. Not for no other reason than just to get the knowledge from that. Not to feel sorry, but just to get that. But I think we have to become really, really strong and hopefully get the right president in who's gonna, you know, change things from what they are right now. I became a citizen five years after I arrived. I also, while I was working at Macy's and we had to work in the evenings, I would ask a few people to help me and one of them always said, I can't help you on Thursdays because I go to the Army Reserves. And so I got curious what it was, so he told me that every Thursday for two hours he goes to the 91st Infantry Division at Park Presidio for two hours. Once a year they go to camp for two, two weeks. And I got curious and I joined. So I got in as a recruit, recruit two that time. And uh, I would go every Thursday to the meetings. Then once a year, we would go to what they call CPA, command post, CPE, command post exercises. And uh, at that time, I was already private. I was promoted. And we were on a firing range, and we had these M1 rifles, and the captain is walking back and forth, and he says, oh, Heller, you, you hit the target. And I said, yes, sir. I wonder if I could have done better if I opened my eyes. And he didn't think it was funny, so he would ask name, rank, and serial number. And I had what they call KP duty for the next two weeks. That means washing dishes, kitchen police. So they don't like it to be funny. <laughs> but anyway, I did stay in the Army Reserves for about five years. and. Uh, I came out even with my dumb jokes as a, a sergeant first class. So luckily I didn't go into war because it would have had problems there. Yeah. Yes? Uh, yeah. Have you had um, met anybody here in the United States who went through a similar experience as you? Yes, there is a, uh, there's a group which meets uh, like every other month or so and uh, we just get together for like a lunch or tea or something like that and just there's a friendship group, yeah. Whenever they have a little project like you mentioned to visit the Holocaust Museum or anything like that as a group, I usually don't go. But I did go in Prague. They had a, uh, they have the Jewish cemetery, they had the uh, museum and uh, I did go there because they had a lot of names of the people which didn't make it, who died, and I was looking for my father or my brother's name, and I couldn't find it, yeah. So, now I do. But in the beginning, I tried so hard to, er to learn English that other than my mother, who I would talk to Czech, I, I tried to just talk in English, so I would learn it. After a while, when I learned some English, people thought maybe I came from New York, that I had a New York accent. I said, no, the only thing from New York I have is now my wife. <laughs>
That two ladies, uh, when I met her, she was really a good-looking blonde. And then later on, she became a brunette, so I don't know what happened. <laughs> but they say after 50 years, you don't get your money back, so... so <laughs> Yes. Uh, can you tell your grandchildren about your past? I gave them that uh, CD and tried to, you know, so they have that. And uh, one one grandson had a, a project at uh, school, just like you having, and uh, so I got interviewed by him, and uh, I didn't make an appearance at their school, but not for that. They wanted to know about advertising, and uh, but. If this is successful, this will be my new career. But, uh, I think I want to get a job which pays. Yes. Yeah, good class. Yes. You mentioned things that uh, you didn't particularly like in what our country was doing. What are some things that you see either in our country or the world today that scare you? Well, first of all, I got a little bit disenchanted uh, with the last election when the first time when Gore and Bush were running. It, the way it came out was that Gore and Bush were each approximately 50 percent and the uh, Florida court awarded Bush the m more votes, which I thought that Florida should have stayed out. I mean, Florida should have made the decision, but not the Supreme Court. I didn't think that this was something for the Supreme Court, where there was voting and counting and not the Supreme Court to do. And uh, I was really concerned that whoever makes it, if it's Gore or Bush, that half of the country didn't vote for him or for, for the other one, that it's not going to be good. But I couldn't believe Obviously, you know that I must be a Democrat, but I couldn't believe that Bush got elected the first time. But to my dismay, I will never want to believe how he got elected the second time. I mean, there was so much unemployment. We're, we're sending our, our factories are now being dismantled and uh, everything is coming either from China or from India or from Mexico. We have more unemployment now. And I think instead of the government making it tax-wise profitable for these big factories to go overseas, there should be a penalty put on it so we wouldn't have as much unemployment here and things of that nature. So I will disenchant and I also feel that I don't know how come nobody came to the rescue of what was going on. I mean f over four million people died before anything was even done. I mean that they couldn't come and go to Poland to rescue some of these camps or do something. And now if when you see the news and see what's going on I, I don't quite understand this cleansing, what they do. I mean, it's just murder. It's no cleansing. That th things happen in Darfur, things happening in Tibet. I think our, our China is going to take over the whole world as far as economics go because we allow it, because we don't support our people here. And uh, I, I just feel that we need hopefully a new president who will change things. I am not a socialist. I'm, I really believe in democracy, but uh, I, I'm just really scared. And I really think if another Bush would come in as a president, that we're in trouble because economically we're totally drained. I mean, billions of dollars are going for the army. In the meantime, our schools are suffering our health is suffering, and uh, I really don't know what's going to happen. I, I'm really worried about the next generation. How do you feel about what's going on in the Middle East with regard to 
the challenges that Israelis and Palestinians face in coexisting? You know, for some reason, Israel or the Jews were always the victims for some reason. I, I don't particularly like what Israel and the Palestinians, their conflict. I really, I being oppressed myself, I don't really appreciate that the Palestinians were oppressed the way they were. But I also feel that the Arab countries really wanted that to happen because they have so much land and everything. <coughs> why they didn't let the Palestinians go to their country. They totally isolated them. And I think Israel wanted to survive is also oppressing the Palestinians. So I don't think that's right either. But I have, you know, different ideas. And I try to stay out of, you know, some people always say that Politics and religion are two things it's best not to discuss because everybody has different ideas. I was born into a Jewish religion. I've never been very religious. Some people think that when you really go through hardship and supposedly suffer and lose loved ones and so on, that religion will be a help to you and give you more strength Unfortunately, in my case, it didn't happen. I do want my children and grandchildren to have a religion and believe in something, but uh, I have a hard time with it. But it's just me, and it's not something I want somebody else to be. I march to a different drummer at times, not always to the same one. Anything else? There's so many more stories I could tell you. They're ugly, and uh, I, I don't know. Yes? Do you see any uh, similarities between um, Germany during World War II and modern countries? Or which country, I guess, could become the new Germany, so to speak? I hope not. I, I don't think there's ever going to be another Hitler, and uh, I just really feel that even right now, when when the uh, torch was coming through San Francisco, there are so many people with different views. I, looking at this, and my critique would have been to demonstrate now, I don't think it's meaningful. I think what should have never happened is that they decided to, to have these Olympics in China. I mean, instead of going through this now in Paris and London to have all these big demonstrations and people getting hurt and jailed and all that. Instead of go through that, never to have it to start off with. I, I don't understand why award a country like China this great privilege on which they're going to be making billions of dollars economically. It's got nothing to do with the uh, athletes. Athletes will go wherever you send them if they're allowed to go in. But I think now to demonstrate is meaningless. I think it should have ne been decided never to bring it to China. That would be, you know, my idea. I think when you demonstrate afterwards, it's too late. I know you want to be heard, and I think we have freedom, we have all that, but uh, I don't think so. Politics is not my strong subject either. <laughs> well, you've been a great class, really. Uh, if there's any other questions, I'll gladly answer if I know. Yes. In the um, con concentration camp, yes. and you saw all the executions and everything, Yes. how I imagine everyone turned away and like didn't want to watch but you couldn't guards, turn away yeah. you you had to look forward yeah How you were surrounded by germans and they wanted you to see it there was no no turning back no when you tell us this story like you don't even show an, a little bit of you know emotion because i'm i can imagine it's so hard because just playing that back in your head yeah. i don't get how you can do that
because of this tragedy that's happened? You know, I've gone over most of the emotions i able to suppress. The only one I cannot suppress as many times as I've done it now, which is maybe the second time when first when I was recorded and so on, the episode when, when I got reunited with my mother, that usually I lose it. And uh, that's really, really hard. And uh, you try to tell you inside that uh, you, you just can't do that. You know, you talk to other people and uh, you just can't. But it's very, very hard. And uh, as many people as you see die in front of you or being killed and so on, it's so cruel, it's so on, but after a while, your, your system somehow, they never accept, it's never accepted, but you can, you can tolerate it, yeah. This has been now for me over 62, 63 years ago that happened. Because like I went to the Holocaust Museum in Washington. Yes. And I looked around and there was this one area that they showed the experiments that they did on the people yes. and it had a thing up high so kids couldn't see. Yeah. And out of everything that thing that just sticks in my head and yes. I didn't even go through the Holocaust, I just can't imagine yeah. how you just I tell you, you it's very hard to to apprehend how cruel people are. I mean it's unbelievable. I mean it's Yeah. Well, I'm glad you went through to see it. It's, uh, and the part with like the shoes and the hair and like how much they have and just everything. Well, they made lampshades out of skin. I mean, it's, it's horrible. Some, sure? some stuff I actually forgot. I really did. Until you just mentioned oh, that. I mean, sorry. that. No, 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 no. No, no, I don't mean that. It. It's, it's there. You, you never forget it, you know. Luckily, I don't forget my wife's birthday. I have it written down. <laughs> you shared with me a, yes. a little anecdote about being on board the ship when you were coming to the United States yes. and about being in a food line with a tray. Ciao. I probably, if I had told you that, I probably couldn't get enough on a tray because I was but I just, I don't remember that one. Without asking whether it was okay to take a piece of fruit. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, no, you're so used to that when you stand in line in, under the Germans, that they give you something on your little, whatever you have, the mess kit, and uh, you never, you never ask, you can never ask for more, you, you will never get any more. And when you when you stand like in a buffet line or food line or whatever you call it, uh, that you can take more later or anything like that, it took me a long, long time. I still like to take my grandkids to the Sizzler mainly because they want to help themselves and uh, they really enjoy it, and I enjoy taking them there or to the because that is the other one. Yeah. For Mother's Day or Thanksgiving and places like that, I always try to make reservations at a place which has a buffet. So my grandkids, some of them take after me, they like dessert first. So they will go <laughs> get the salad and a pie at the same time, making sure that the pie is still there later. So One other thing, I uh, somehow, one of my trademarks now is I still have an office in a store, and I have one little box there, it's pretty good size, which is full of chocolates. And anybody who comes in, salesman or, or anything like that, I always like to give them a chocolate bar because that's something I so missed during the war, was chocolate or sweets. So that's one of my hang-ups now, that uh, if Walgreens has a sale on chocolate bars at three for a dollar, I will get at least a dozen of them and make sure that we have them and uh, it's there. I think the patron, patronage of your store just went up by about 30 people. Um, Good, I wish they would come. Greatly appreciate you being oh, here and sharing thank your Thank you for experience. asking me, really. You got a great class and uh, I can say if there's anything else uh, you want to ask, go right ahead. 
Can't tell you much about those girls from Brazil. They're <laughs> short-lived. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, thank you.